Hello and welcome to 392. Let's see here if I got this correct. Sorry about the locomotion. I will today talk about fear of opening, openness, which is the title. Uh, this is uh, partly inspired by a trip we had from Narke, uh, where we were listening to Stephen M. Rosen, and that got my thinking kicking. I was driving at the same time, and it seems those things can enter the consciousness in a way that otherwise is blocked out because you want to understand and if you want to understand we all know that you have a, some sort of preconception which is necessary i admit to understand something uh, but in this specific case when we're speaking about there being no meta logic there is a big problem because your preconception will stop you from understanding isn't that interesting in a way? Uh, and therefore I call this uh, lecture H 692 the fear of openness. This openness Stephen M. Rosen calls the apeiron, the first philosophical word ever to enter our philosoph philosophical vocabulary coming from Anaximander. All we have is a fragment of a piece of parchment. But there you go. The apparent is the limitless, the boundless, the openness. And although my inspiration partly came from, Naga uh, from Stephen M. Rosen, I would like to continue with Nagarjuna. And Nagarjuna has been compared to both Wittgenstein, which is quite interesting, Derrida, which is not half bad, there I think there is even a couple of books written about that connection, but also Heidegger. And in the case of Heidegger, we are already thrown into the world and war, our trying to understand the world is part of the world. And this is what I mean with this car trip. To have preconceived ideas works fine when you want to understand, for instance, how a grass cutter works or how to water plants carefully or how to uh, travel to a place that's very hard to get to preconception would be helpful. In this case, it's not. And this makes this case rather cumbersome, very different from ordinary cases altogether. So this question of the fear of openness is connected to non-duality. And non-duality is just because of the reasons I mentioned before, not as easy as any other subject. If you think non-duality could be perceived in the way you learn about a new ideology, a philosophy, you are dead wrong. Because the understanding, all the meta-language, meta-logic, has to be inside. Nothing can be outside. And I will try to show here, it's so easy to put yourself outside. Still, I would say it is inevitable. Our wish to understand will stop us from understanding. But there is still a way. Don't despair. I uh, will give you a lead here. If the world is a uh, holistic, then things as proposed by common conceptions of non-duality 
will be sort of dependent on the whole for their existence. But we usually say that, and we usually don't think about the property of being separate is not a property. We just assume that because, as I just said, the properties to the little is coming from the whole and thereby I'm already forgetting isn't, the, isn't it a property to be separate? Isn't discreteness in itself a property? And that's a lesson actually from Nagarjuna. And this takes, this takes you to logic of contradiction. Because that is a definite contradiction. It would lead to contradiction, it would lead to paradoxes. Uh, and you will probably also understand here how easy it is to let meta logic slip in back somewhere. Just when you think you discarded meta logic, it comes knocking on the door and you let it in unbeknownst. You don't even know he or she is there. Because in your trying to understand, you have a frame, and that frame contains the transcendent, the model, or whatever it could be. So you could say like the following, the independent nature of reality, both the small things and the big things are made independent by the wholeness. So independency is not a feature or a property that is a part. That's not coming from the whole. And uh, I can imagine you are already developing in a headache. I do have one already. And the headache is, how on earth could that be? How could it be that being an individual is a property and it's coming from the whole? Well, it is not unproposed earlier. Remember the Leibnizian monarchs. The Leibnizian monads are shapeless things without windows. You cannot look into them and understand what properties they have. Doesn't it make sense that inside is not even the property of being an individual? That also have to be outside. Our worldly determined what it is to be a discrete and individual thing. And that is actually the case in quantum physics. That's a mathematical description of what a singular point is. That has to be described and it's coming from the whole. It's not self-evident to be an individual. So here's the rather surprising thing then. This would actually mean to have very strong sense of separatedness. To be in no connection at all to anything else is coming much more from non-duality than duality. That is the lesson for Nagarjuna. He takes it a step further and I'm quite sure we need to do that. We need to go the whole way. We cannot stop halfway. A compromise won't work when it comes to this because if we let some little things slip in that is 
preconceived after the fact then we already committed the error we want to avoid. So it's a very good start to understand what we have in front of us. It's a logical problem. But it's not any logic. It's a logic that takes contradictions without having constructing a meta logic. The paradox is not in your head, the paradox is in the world. And that's a great difference. Very important to remember. The paradox is in the world, not in your head or in your thinking. And this is what Rosen said when he meant ontological paradox. The contradiction is in reality, not ontically, as perceived per us. It sounds like a riddle that individuality comes from the whole, but it cannot be any other way. And I think that's a necessary step to take if you want to make some sort of understanding that is complete, whole, and coming from reality and applies to reality. That's a rather grand project and it's a fantastic project. That means that we are landing in reality. We can put our feet into reality and it's completely real in its all distinctiveness and individuality, but at the same time being an undivided whole. So let me repeat, repeat the enigma, the riddle. Being separated, being distinct, being discrete, being an individual are properties or is a property coming from the whole. It's a little bit, well it's not even similar, but somewhat in the actual format of this thinking is a little bit similar to what Bertrand Russell said about properties that they're coming from wholenesses, but those wholenesses are separated. The sets are set. It's a very good pun there. The sets are set in something bigger, and that bigger he doesn't mention. But in a way, it's in the model, it's a bit similar. So being an individual, being separated from the whole, is a real factor in Nagarjuna. It has complete reality to it. It's not something, sort of an illusion. Uh, it's real. And I think most non-dual theories misses that point. And that's... Uh, very, very important point to make, I think, because it has to come somewhere. It cannot just be there from nowhere. I would say, and this is my idea today, that this is actually what Wittgenstein is saying about the language game. The idea of the language game is not coming from outside the language game, it's inside the language game. Therefore, the explanation is not valid but it can still be helpful. That was the point Wittgenstein made.
The examples in the book, Philosophical Investigations, are not valid examples. Because they lift something out of the whole, but they are there for a didactical purpose, to help you. But if we still do, and I will try to show that is very common. Actually, that's what we always do, I'd say. A, if we do that, if we say that the term language game is outside the language game, we are committing exactly the same mistake of having something external, otherworldly, transcendental. We are once back into the idea of object in space in front of a subject. A transcendental, non-defined other. B. And this part is tougher. And just as Stephen M. Rosen discovered that each time there has been a scientific breakthrough in the direction of a more open situation is the title of the lecture for that reason. The transcendental, the defining, the border has always emerged. First, in Einsteinian general relativity, we tried to show, or he tried to, solve the problem with three dimensions. For instance, we cannot solve the free body problem. And there's a lot of other problems with gravity. So he lets in a fourth dimension into play. That's called space time. And all of a sudden he solves the problem. And hooray, hurika. Problem solved. Not so. Einstein himself, I discovered, somewhere on the line suspected this could also break. And if something became too heavy, everything could collapse. He was really afraid of this, this singularity. And what happened? We have now discovered the singularities in the universe that makes the Einsteinian concept of a regulated space collapse. So what he won in three dimensions was severely lost in four dimensions. He didn't get rid of the problem by creating um, not carefully defined metalogic, because if it would have been carefully defined, we would have known this is going to collapse. So black holes proved Einstein wrong. The breakthrough in space-time is a disaster for general relativity. Stephen M. Rosen goes further and says that even the Copenhagen interpretation puts up some boundaries to get rid or contain in a receptacle the openness of reality. Here, the made up man made boundary is the graviton. And then he shows that even in string theory that looks so promising, it sneaks into it. And those things can actually be very hard to realize. It sneaks in somewhere from the starting point when you try to understand it, when you try to grasp it. That is the moment 
when we go from the implicit to the explicit, to use a Bohmian term, which actually can be very helpful here. If we stick and use the explicit format, then we'll go to run into some paradoxes. Maybe now or maybe later, but at the same time we do it, there are already established in a Gudelian way. Fixed dimensions was the solution in string theory. So the last and concluding paragraph for my sake here today is, well, the conclusion must be, if we have not gotten a way with the transcendental, we have, if we put in the transcendental, we haven't achieved anything at all, nothing. It looks that for a while and we're really happy, but it hasn't happened. And this is where Nagarjuna takes it a step further. We need to look carefully into what contradictions really are. And we need to change that a bit. We need to open up this openness that is needed for her. And this openness we need to get accustomed to. Stephen and Rosen call it the apparel, the open field, the boundless, the scary. Nagarjuna means, on the other hand, there is nothing scary at all about the apparel or the openness. Actually, that is the place where everything comes from. And actually, even and this is the most surprising thing. It's from the apparel that the borders come. The natural borders. The borders we need to understand. Not man-made borders, not subjective borders that we human beings in our reflective consciousness, I imagine, uses to ward off something about reality. We have an aversion for for no good reason. And this is the Greek and people of the antiquity in a nutshell. They got scared of something there is no need to get scared about. And that's the main problem. I think the whole business would have been so much easier if they were scared of something that could be dangerous. And the potential of that. Instead, they get scared of something that we need. And that's a surprise, I'd say, coming from Nagarjuna. It's a traumatic thing the Greek people are showing up where they get scared for nothing at all. And it being nothing at all is the greatest part of the problem would have been sold by now if it was something we could be afraid of. But it's very hard to make that full jump. Nagarjuna shows a way. You need to take a gander at the logic and understand that logic itself comes from the whole. It's not something outside the wholeness. Logic itself. Contradictions are actually made inside the whole. And that's the solution. It makes sense. It's completely rational. And it leads to some surprising effects. But by acknowledging those effects, you will gain openness. And this openness is all abundant. And we can have firm established borders that come from reality, not man-made, not subjectively made, towards something out that we don't even know what it is, just because we are worried about it. Okay, I round up here and I say thank you very much and I wish you a pleasant afternoon. Bye-bye.